right? Never in the Bible do you hear a church referred to as a building, except a building of people, living stones. So you're in the church, and I hope you know that. I hope you're experiencing that. I am so glad that uh, everybody has participated this morning up front in a way that has brought me to the throne of grace. That's inspiring for me. Uh, other little secret of most preachers. Yeah, we're sitting there. We're wanting to be ushered to the throne of grace through all of these other aspects of our worship services, not just the sermon time. So thank you everybody for participating, appreciated the song, the children's story, all the praise music, and uh, the call for offering the prayers already offered in the truly appreciate that. I'd like to pause to also pray if you would join me in your hearts. Father, I thank you for giving me a full plate already this morning. It's all level ground at the foot of the cross, Lord. We all need you equally. So thank you for preparing for us a table this morning, a spiritual feast. Some of us gain a little more nutrition, I guess, spiritually speaking, from one thing versus another, but all of it, we pray, comes from you. May you continue to linger in our presence, Lord, and cause us to hear your voice beyond the human voice. In Jesus' name. How many of you admit it now, even the men, how many of you grew up liking some fairy tales? Those children's stories, not necessarily Christian, but, you know, having some virtue to them nonetheless. Do you remember one called, hmm, what, there's one coming to mind right now, hold on. Oh yes, Snow White. Let me actually see hands here. How many people really know the story of Snow White? You know that story. Very good. You know there's several versions. And the very original version is quite... Wow. It might be PG-17. Uh, but Disney... Disney toned it down. They ratcheted it down. And that's probably the most familiar version. The most popularized version. So popular that it's come out in books, it's come out in movies, and even the ice capades. The ice capades. I'm recalling a time when a five year old girl who really liked those stories, and especially Snow White, heard that that particular story was coming to the ice capades in her area. Oh, she was so happy about that, and she asked her mom if they could go, and mom say, said yes. And the day came, and they arrived there at the ice rink, and oh boy, they were going to see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs on ice. Now, as you can imagine, at five years old, sometimes the line between reality and imagination Sometimes the line between fact and fiction, it's a little blurred. In fact, even for some of us adults, that gets blurred sometimes. It's amazing what we can fool ourselves into. But especially at five years old. And here is this little girl watching one of her favorite stories unfold through the professionalism of these ice skaters. She is just engrossed and enraptured in the story. She is right there. And her eyes are just... Why? Almost the whole time. There comes that scene, you know it well, when the wicked witch, this woman in the land who wants to be the fairest of them all, but Snow White happens to be the fairest, right? That stinking mirror. I sometimes don't like mine either. <laughs> she wants to be the fairest of them all, and the only way to do that is get rid of Snow White. But, you know, she just comes up as a witch and says, Hey, here, have some of this poison I prepared for you. Probably not going to work. So she makes this apple and infuses it with poison. And she dresses up 
masquerades as this peasant woman peddling her wares and comes upon Snow White when the seven dwarves are not there. They've already warned her, don't let anybody in. Don't. Well, the peasant comes. Snow White being the pure, innocent person she is, she just can't say no. And there the witch comes, saying, how about this apple? Very inexpensive, I'll give it to you. It's delicious, look at it. In some versions, she even takes a bite herself to show that it's okay, because in some versions, only half the apple is poisoned. The girl is watching with rapt attention. She is so emotionally caught up that when she watches that witch in the disguise of this peasant peddling woman hold out this apple and say, here you go, take it. She just can't help herself. She has no control. And she stands up right there by her seat and she yells out, no, don't take it. She's a stranger. Don't take it. She's a stranger. Yes. We have an innate fear of the unknown, a fear of strangers, don't we? And it's not all bad. It, it's not all bad. Sometimes it protects us from some things, some bad things, right? But what about God? Sometimes we, that fear of the unknown, that fear of strangers, hinders us really connecting with God. Because if you want to be honest about it, compared to us, God is a stranger. He's strange. We cannot know everything there is to know about God. And there's different depictions of Him out there. And to think of Him as who He really is, we have to admit, at best, we know parts of Him. We know some things about Him. But we don't know all of God. And to some degree, he's a stranger. And unfortunately, when he comes to us holding out not poisonous things, not destructive things, not harmful things, but good things, wonderful things, prosperous things, beneficial things, constructive things, we may not reach out and take it. Because there's that voice behind us, that there's that voice inside of our head saying, No, don't take it. He is a stranger. You don't really know Him. Doesn't that happen sometimes to you? Even after we've walked with God a while, even after we've come to know Him a bit, sometimes some things occur in our lives that cause us to wonder if we really do know Him. If He really is who He has said He is. If He really is who we have come to believe, at least up to that point of time, who we think He is. Well, what has God done about this problem? I would like to suggest that God knows this problem. I like to read billboards and bumper stickers and stuff. I like this one. Well, you did ask for a sign. God. Have you ever asked for a sign? I've asked for a sign. I met this beautiful brown-haired girl in college. Lord, is she the one? Can you show me something that would let me know? It's really cool seeing how many of you look over there at my wife. I got the sign. Should I really move from this? When I first moved up to Washington, I was at a church in Sacramento. Just. Great happening church. We had, by the grace of God, progressed a lot, miles. And now I thought, boy, we are really on our way now. God has so blessed us. It was right about the time I really thought we were going to be taking off that I get a call to Washington State. God, I need, I need a sign. I need to know if you're in this or not. 
earlier in my life, I wanted to just know, does he exist? And is this book we call the Bible really about him? And I asked for signs. Has God given us any signs of his existence? Not a rhetorical question, by the way. I like discussion. I think my Sabbath school class will tell you that. Has God given us any signs that he exists? Give me one. I want to see a hand, though, because I don't want 300 voices. All I've only got two ears. I can only hear some. Yes. Resurrection. That Jesus resurrected. Hmm. A good book to read on that is Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, where he examined the resurrection as a investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune paper with a lawyer background no less. And he investigates the resurrection and says, you know what, just looking at this rationally, this is plausible, this is believable. Interesting. Darby, did I see your hand? Creation. How many like that one? We're thinking of that one. Ah -ha. Now let's get more specific. What in creation, what about creation? Pick some aspect, okay? Darby's opened this big wide door for us. I want to see it again. Give me a specific aspect of creation, portion of creation that says something to you. Ah, uh, yes, my fellow uh, silver tooth person. Yes. The human body. You think it's pretty fascinating? What about it is fascinating? It's so complex. Can't just do that with a few molecules and add some lightning, huh? Okay. Yeah, it is very complex. In fact, each system is complex, right? Just the cardio system is complex. Just the respiratory system is complex. Just the digestive system is complex. Now, we're all having this acid pour into our stomach. Why isn't it eroding? I mean, little things like that. But not only are, is each aspect complex, but they all interact. So in harmony, they've got this complex complexity of their interaction. You don't have to quote me on that, though. My English teacher is probably... <laughs> But you get what I mean? I mean, all these complex systems interacting in a very complex way. Hmm, interesting. I saw some other hands here. Yes, Katie. His son. His son. What do you mean by that? Give me another sentence. He stepped out of heaven. Now, if I was not a believer, how could I come to believe in him? Ooh, accepted by faith. There are some things. I, I'm wanting to primarily stay with the things that we could understand rationally, intellectually. But Katie's touched on something. There's some things about God that we can only accept by faith. I would like to suggest that God gives us enough evidence, enough signs, so to speak, of His existence and what He's like to bring us, like me, to the brink of this stage, but it can't bring me any further in my walk with Jesus. At some point, I have to step out by faith. I have to step out by faith. Poor Billy's like, don't you dare step off there. Right? <laughs> that mom I heard going on. Is that true? Saw another hand back here. Yes, behind Norman. I saw Jesus. You saw Jesus. Anybody here see Jesus? In what kind of way? We want to know. Revelation three twenty. Ah, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And when if I anyone... opened the door, my life changed. Amen. You've seen Jesus work in your life. Amen. Anybody else have that experience? Yeah, I hope so. There's that faith part again. I know as a non-believer, or at least a questioning believer, I wanted to test people who told me that. Another hand in the back. Yes. There are so many prophecies in the Bible that have come true that we can have faith 
that those that are for the future will also come true, that's a rational approach. What about Bible prophecy? Amen. I mean, Amen. Daniel 2 alone, I mean, you've got these four major kingdoms leading to a divided kingdom. The Bible says we'll never have another totally dominant world ruling power, singular power. And history has followed that like a blueprint. Amazing. Bob, what was my question? <laughs> My question was, are you just like pulling my leg? Oh, strawberries. And evidence of not only God's existence, but his love. There's only a few people here, I'm sure, that don't like strawberries. Just a few. But when your taste buds get sanctified, you too will like strawberries. Don't worry about it. You're, you'll be progressing. It's okay. Can you do this again? Young, young, young person in here. Go ahead, tell me. Little coaching. Oh, you probably had a great idea. How does God show us that He really did? The flowers. The flowers. Wow. You know, God could have been very utilitarian, just make one kind of plant, one color, no beauty, no scent. No softness to any petals. Just, hey, there it is. It's very utilitarian. Take in carbon dioxide, give off oxygen. It's doing its thing. But he makes all kinds of plants. And he gives them all kinds of colors. And he puts all kinds of flowers on them with all kinds of petals and scents. Hmm. Part of the complexity of creation. I know we can go on and on. I'm glad you're thinking like that. In my Sabbath school class, we've gone over the doctrine of creation in the Bible. And we've looked at some of the even more detailed things of the details of creation. How did life really begin? And I like to read books by diehard evolutionists who know science. I also like to read good, deep scientific books from creations. And what we have to admit is ultimately we come to only three possibilities. Folks. So it's just, it all boils down to either one of three. Either A, life exists as we know it from nothing. Ex nihilo, from nothing. Everything came out of nothing. That's one. Number two, matter in some basic primordial form always existed. There was always some eternally existent matter that finally got its act together and created life as we know. Or the third possibility is there is some intelligent designer who has always existed. Who made the matter and then made the matter see I've got a master's degree do stuff. <laughs> okay? I, to me, is, is there another possibility? I, I can't, I mean, I've got a pretty good imagination, but to me, it, it all boils down to that. Either everything we see exists from nothing, or 
some matter always existed and then did stuff. Or there's this intelligent designer who's always existed and made the matter and did stuff. Therefore, since none of that is observable today in a detailed form, I suggest that everybody on the planet holds their view by faith. There is no absolute proof, there is only evidence. And we may read that evidence differently. But God's put it there because God wants us to know Him. And so He does things in creation. And He lets us find out laws that help us to find Him. A lot of evolutionists believe, well, life, uh, life got started from these basic things that always existed. Yeah, I'm being a little simple here, but yeah, it all got started from these basic things that just always existed. Okay? But you take that by faith. Because we see really nothing that came from nothing. In other words, we don't see some things that came from nothing. That's never been observed in a lab or in nature. In a conclusive way. Have it. So science says, okay, well we have this atmosphere that, uh, see proteins don't form, amino acids cannot form in an oxygenated environment. Antioxidants have become popular because cancer cells can't do their destructive thing in a highly oxygenated environment that wake up. So they say, well, the Earth's atmosphere did not have oxygen and that's how these amino acids all started hooking up to make proteins and then these proteins made DNA and on and on and on. Okay. Only problem is if you take away the oxygen so those chemical reactions can take place, there's no ozone. So the sun's rays come piercing down and they destroy whatever's trying to get together down here. So either you have the oxygen with this protective ozone layer so stuff can happen, but then that stuff can't happen because there's oxygen and it's a catch-22. It suggests that there had to be simultaneous existence. So they say, oh well it got started in water. It was protected from the lack of ozone because life got started in water. Well wait a minute. Water has a destructive effect on the bonds of amino acids. So that, yeah. I mean, these are, these are things we've come to know by science. We know them. They're not theories. We know these things happen. So I'm thinking the evidence is pretty good for number three. There's this intelligent designer who made matter. And he made it with a certain, quote, age quality. He made it so it was all harmonious and existence at, existing at once. And he got this ball rubble. This ball rubble. Uh, here it is, right? Ball. He's given us signs, folks. He's helped us discover the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. That when things are left to themselves, they either stay as complex as they are or decrease in complexity and utterly go by the wayside. That's a law. We've observed it in nature, in the laboratory. And yet, the theory of evolution that says we evolved from lower life forms that continue to progress up this ladder flies right in the face of that law. The theory is overridden by the law. And we can go on and on and on with these things that God has allowed us to discover because He wants us to discover Him. So science can bring us to the point of saying, wow, there's really this intelligent design there must be a designer. And then we can step off by faith and start to get to know Him. That's what the Bible is all about, right? That's what the Bible is all about. It's this God seeking us. And He seeks us partly by giving us signs. So we have things in nature, all aspects of nature and science. And we have not only that natural or general revelation, we have specific spiritual revelation in His Word. 
And then we start testing his word, even by reason. And it seems like, wow, this book, yes, I know there's questions. I know there are questions. There are seeming contradictions. I know all that too. But when I look at prophecy, when I look at how it's composed, when I look at how it's, pre how it's preserved, when I look at what it does say about sciences in specific ways and see how it validated archaeology and so forth, I've got to say, wow, this book is of divine origin. I believe God is speaking to me. See, God's pursuing you. He knows you have a fear of the strange, of the unknown. And that's okay. But He's trying to break past that so that you and I would know Him. He's pursuing us. He's watching after us. Jesus said, I came to seek and save what? The lost. Those who've lost out on that connection, that intimate connection with God. He forms man and woman in the garden. Adam and Eve are there. He gives them one tree and says, don't eat from that tree. Some people say, well, why did he make that tree? He kind of set them up for failure. No, he set them up for love. He set them up for allegiance, for trust. If he didn't put that tree there, they couldn't help but obey. That's all there was to do, was what he said to do. So he makes a myriad, who knows how many hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of trees to eat from. I've given you every seed-bearing plant, every fruit. And then there's just this one. Because God wants to give them a choice. He doesn't want forced, forced worship, forced allegiance, false love. He just gives them that one. But they eat from it. They eat from the one. They rebel. They disobey. They cross his boundary. And does he say, okay, you're on your own. You want to learn the hard way? Learn the hard way. No. He comes to them. It says he came into, read Genesis 3, he came into the garden. And he says, well, what's their reaction, by the way? What do they do when he's coming? They're going. They hide. He comes and so he says, where are you? He is not wondering where they are in geography here. He's making a statement. Like when my mom would say, do you want a licking? I never thought of answering that with a yes. It was a statement. Michael, you continue to do that, you will regret it with a sore bottom. That was a statement, not a question. Do you want a licking? Where are you? Is a statement. Look, my dear children, where your choice has brought you. I used to come in this garden, and you'd briskly walk towards me, and I would briskly walk towards you, and we would have a great time together. Look now where your decision has brought you. Look where you are. But see, God sought them. He called them out, and He spoke to them, and He told them He already had a plan in place to mend the break that they had fostered. And ever since then, we can go all through the pages of the Bible, all through the earth's history, and it's God pursuing us. We get to Jesus coming on the scene, and He says, I came to seek and save the lost. Those who've lost out on that relationship with me, at least the intimacy, the degree of intimacy, who've lost out on living eternally, lost out on living in a perfect world, I've come to seek and save the lost. And in John 10, he speaks of himself as the good shepherd who seeks his sheep. Yes, we do seek God in a way, but it's only because he's first seeking us. He's the great initiator. Our natural inclination, hide from him. So the very fact you're sitting here this morning, those of you who want to hear his voice, those of you who want the deeper walk with him, that's evidence God is working in your life. He's pursued you. He has charmed you. Maybe he's elbowed you. Maybe he's disciplined you. But you recognize at least to some degree some of his love and you're responding. Some of you are here today saying, Lord, I'm willing to do what you want me to do. Some of you, some of us, if we're honest, at least in some areas of our life, 
we're only to the point of saying, Lord, I'm not willing, but I'm willing to be made willing. And praise the Lord for that. He is the one pursuing us. And just as a, sh a shepherd would go after the sheep, the sheep's not looking for the shepherd, it's lost. But the shepherd is calling out, crying out, walking all over the place, risking his own life, calling out. And finally the sheep hears the voice. And then the sheep starts to bleed. And if it's not stuck someplace, we'll walk towards the shepherd. Now it's seeking the shepherd, but only first because the shepherd has sought the sheep. Your response this morning is evidence that God has sought you and you're responding. Praise the Lord for that. In order to bring you to himself though, Oh, I like that song this morning. Purify my heart. God knows you and I have characters that need some work. David, the psalmist, recognized this. He says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than... Whiter than what? Snow. Snow. Hmm, we started off with that snow stuff, didn't we? Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Do a little Bible study. Look at how many times white as wool and white as snow are used in the Bible. Common description of God whenever He appears, that He appears in this brilliant white like wool or white like snow. David recognized he needed to have his character cleansed. He knew he was a character, now he needs his character cleansed, right? That's the description of me too. So he says, Lord, okay, have your way with me. Wash me. So that I can be clean and ultimately stand in your presence. He didn't know that Isaiah, some years later, would pen these words of God. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins, though your rebellious ways, though your ways that are not of faith be as scarlet, they shall be as white as what? Snow. Though they be red like crimson. They will be like the bull. God is saying, I want to do that. I want to make you snow white so you can stand in my presence and not be destroyed by the brilliance of my holiness. It would be like bringing a match to some gasoline fumes. Oh, ignite. But God says, no, I want to purify you. I want to change you from within so that when I show up, you simply come with me. You simply come with me. And so he's seeking to do that in our lives. Let's go back to that scripture verse. Start to conclude here. John, the revelator, says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned around, I saw seven gold lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were blazing fire. Hmm. We need this purity, right? Look what John wrote in a letter. That same John who wrote that about his encounter with Christ. He says, Dear friends, we are now the children of God. We are now the children of God. Some of you aren't willing to accept that yet. You think you've got to clean up something in your life to be a child of God. That's a lie. You are a child of God now. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be what? Like Him. And He is snow white. We will be snow white. For we will see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in himself or herself purifies himself. Wow. See that? This becoming snow white. Yes, it works. In 1 John 1, 7, how do we do it? If we walk in the light, as He, God, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son. There it is again, purifies us from all sin. I think of that as simply saying, gets us ready to live in His presence forever. Ah, yes, snow white. I want to be snow white. There's a lot of correlations, by the way, to salvation in that story I was thinking of this week. But I want to conclude with this story. By the way, that blood of Jesus, think about that. I hope we're all spending time every day thinking of the cross.
where all of our wrongs were paid for right there. Every single one. Even the ones you and I have repeated. Even the ones you and I promised we'd never do again. All of it paid for at the cross. You remember this story? I saw it in a book and then I've, I've heard it as a sermon illustration more than once. This woman is driving home, alone, late at night, through a dark area, no lights. She comes upon a service station and she sees it up in the distance and she looks at her gas gauge and she's about an eighth of a tank. She thinks she has enough gas to make it home but doesn't want to chance it, so she pulls into the gas station. Not having a credit card, she goes into the mini mart to pay for her purchase. She comes out, gets in her car, takes off, and notices that a semi-truck has pulled out right after she pulls out. No problem. Happens all the time, right? She's driving down the road and she notices that that semi is staying fairly close to her. And she decides to speed up a little bit. So she does. And the semi speeds up to stay the same distance. Now she's getting a little concerned. Well, maybe he just needs to make a good haul tonight. But I'm not comfortable with this, so I'm going to speed up even more. So she starts doing 20 over the speed limit. He's still the same distance. He's keeping up. Whatever she's doing, he's doing. She goes a little faster yet. He stays up. Now she's panicking. What is with this guy? Is he going to try to run me off the road? What's he going to try to do? And she's just wondering, what, what, am, what am I going to do? What's going to happen? And she keeps driving and driving and driving, hoping she comes across some place where she could pull in. And eventually she sees another service station. A small, tiny bit of relief washes over her, and she pulls into that station, pulls right up to the parking places by the mini mart, and jumps out of her car as she hears the trucker barreling in and slamming on his brakes. And she runs into that mini mart, and as she starts screaming and yelling to the guy behind the counter, they're both now looking out just in time to see the trucker jump out of his car, run over to her car, open up the back door, and pull out a guy. The trucker keeps him in a restraining hold up against the car. The guy eventually resist, stops resisting. Out comes the Mini Mart guy and the woman, the driver. And out of breath, the truck driver says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I scared you. I didn't mean to. I'm just trying to help you. At that station where you were filling up, I was in my truck and I noticed when you went inside, this guy slipped in the back seat of your car. I'm sorry, Mr. Greater. I just wanted to help you. Think of it. That woman, trying to get farther and farther away from someone she thought was wanting to hurt her, and it wound up to be somebody that was trying to save her from a very horrible event. Wow. What about God? What about God? What kind of intent does he have for us? He's like the trucker. We may mistake his intent, but he tells us his intent. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. He wants to prosper us, folks. I'm sure some of us have some hard decisions to make right now. Do we really want to give the Lord full sway? Do we really want to give God total rulership over our lives? Even over those particular areas that are difficult. He's saying, look, my plans are what they always are. They're to prosper you, not to harm you. I know I can seem strange to you. I know my word even says that my thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. They're way above your ways. I know in Romans it says my judgments and my ways are unsearchable, beyond finding out. But I'm telling you, though they be strange to you sometimes, though I, though I may use strange people or strange circumstances in your life, I want to prosper you. Will you trust me? I'm pursuing you, not to harm you, but to help you. Father in heaven, I thank you for your holy word. I thank you for the many examples you've given us the nature of your existence and even some of your identity. I thank you mostly for Jesus 
who not only shows us you exist, he shows us what you are like. Father, help us to know you better. Help us to trust you more. Help us to let you truly purify us and make us ready for this eternal, perfect existence of unending days. For we ask it in Jesus' name.